Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, for our spring semester artist lecture. My name is Angel Kleiman and I'm the director of the Rosemary Duffy Larson Gallery here on central campus of Broward College. And tonight we're speaking with Jim Graham and Lee Merrill, uh, the artists behind Lat Latent Adaptations, which is our current show in the gallery that opened uh, today. Uh, the show runs through April 6th. We will be closed uh, all of next week, starting on Monday for our spring break. Um, but other than that, definitely come and check it out. There's nothing like seeing it in person. Of course, we always share our images on social media and on our website, but there really is nothing like seeing this show in person for sure. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Jim, why don't you uh, take the floor and share with us? Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, give me just a second. I'll get the uh, slideshow up here for us. Mm -hmm. All right, are we up and running, Angel? Sure are. All right, perfect. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Angel, for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, obviously, I feel a bit thwarted. I wish I could be in Miami with you guys. Um, you know, if this had been a show in Detroit, I would be less, you know, less worried about not being there, but it would have been really fun to be in Miami. Um, Thank you for everyone that's joining. Uh, thank you, Lee, uh, for being here as well and doing the show with me. I'm so excited to have uh, Angel introduce your work to me. This was awesome. I'm, I'm really happy to, uh, to be here with both of you. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, 2020 marked a a pivot in my work where I shifted from, you know, kind of these larger ecologies to um, more of a land, uh, more of a still life tradition. Um, maybe the pandemic, you know, had a, a, a hand in that. Um, we saw everything, all of our spaces kind of collapse um, into each other. Um, I was uh, working from home, my children were home, uh, so maybe, you know, I was thinking about these uh, maybe larger ecologies and larger landscapes that I had been working on pre-pandemic and started thinking about the home as kind of this uh, smaller ecology that, um, uh, that also uh, was worth taking a look at in a way that maybe I hadn't done before. Um, so I started thinking of this work, again, as microecologies, maybe a blend of uh, the wilderness and the domestic. Um, the title, Tabletop Softy, really was the best way that I could describe the paintings that I've done in the last two years. Uh, so maybe they're landscapes that start to look uh, a lot like still life paintings or still life paintings that act like landscapes, and uh, maybe that lands me in the kind of landscape light area for this show. Um, but I was really excited to kind of make this shift and, 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 and share it um, with, with y'all in Miami. So um, when I think about these two genres in practice, um, they both present very different uh, observational challenges for a painter and also, you know, op different opportunities. Um, landscape is very unpredictable. Um, you know, obviously you have kind of a shifting light, moving subjects, this expansive content that is, is bigger than the canvas that you're working from. Um, so you end up making these adjustments. You end up making these um, kind of shorthand um, uh, shifts towards looking at rhythm, looking at line, looking at mark making in a way that is expressing the kind of expansive view that you have in a relatively small space. Um, obviously, still life kind of solves these challenges by um, minimizing the variables. You know, um, we're looking at uh, making for a very consistent light source, um, stable subjects, uh, you know, maybe an attainable scope of observation where you kind of have this 
this handheld world versus this, um, again, more expansive ecology. Um, but in doing so, you kind of lose that broader context of, of place. Um, the work that we're looking at here is Coastal Lot with Plastic Finger Puppet. Um, this was really the first piece and the only piece in the show that was completed before the pandemic. This was kind of coming out of um, work that I had been doing with low-lined coastal areas in Florida and southern Louisiana. Um, and I think that maybe of the two genres that I was speaking of there, you can see a lot more of the landscape influence with maybe the still life objects kind of coming to the forefront. Um, and, and I think that I, I, I wanted to include this piece as maybe um, the bookend or the start of that, that shift towards a, a two year um, uh, a journey into the still life or into prioritizing the still life. Um, knowing that there's kind of, uh, there, there's likely a lot of students uh, um, with us here today, I, I wanted to share two artists that, you know, when, when kind of introducing this concept um, to my painting classes, I like to use both of these examples. Um, on the left, we have Cecily Brown, who is one of my all-time favorite painters. I think when it comes to um, making a painting with, with, with an energetic touch, um, bringing emotion, bringing mark making, bringing landscape and all of its um, uh, inconsistencies to the forefront, Cecily Brown is at the top of the list for me. Like I, um, I, you know, I think that she really exemplifies that. But she also kind of exemplifies how when you start going that far towards uh, shifting objects, uh, different light sources, different shadows, um, multiple subjects within a single composition, you definitely start to lose um, the specificity of a singular object, um, where as I look at David Hockney on the right, um, who I think is, you know, uh, often quoted from painters that are looking for examples of that shifting of observation. To me, this is kind of an example of that first shift from someone that was looking at a still life object looking hard at a singular object, a singular subject, one light source, but just moving the camera, right? Just keeping, uh, may maybe setting the object into a, into the humanities a little bit, right? Like taking, taking it away from that singular viewpoint and kind of giving us just that shifting perspective in a way that is more like how we experience the landscape. Um, and so I think both of these artists are definitely at the forefront of kind of how I would like my work to be seen or, or the, the context of which I kind of um, feel like I'm coming from. And uh, I, I just wanted to include both of these as kind of, you know, David Hockney as a, a, as a presenter of everyday objects. Um, he calls these his joiners, by the way. Um, I, I, I just think that this is kind of one of those one of those moments where a, a painter looks at photography in a way that um, helps to really start to inform his practice. Um, and again, kind of looking at this dichotomy between landscape and still life. And maybe uh, this will be a piece that we kind of return to towards the, the end of the presentation, but um, I, I hope that maybe you kind of see a blend here between, between those two artists. Um, I think that the, the floral arrangement and household plants, when I started thinking about ecology coming to the, the handheld world or the house or um, again, kind of moving from landscape to still life, I was thinking about, um, uh, I, I think that, that this piece kind of represents that shift of perspective, um, trying to make an object that is in front of me and painted from observation uh, feel a little bit more like the, the expansive ecologies that I was looking at in, in other works. 
I was also looking a lot at uh, Pieter Eriksson's Meat Stall with Holy Family Giving Alms. Um, this is from 1551. It's often cited as one of the first still life paintings. Um, obviously, the still life had been kind of used as a motif in genre paintings before this time, but this is really kind of when you talk to art historians, it's kind of a marker of of, of the first still life painting. Um, and in this particular composition, Erickson flips that traditional pictorial hierarchy, right? He's very much foregrounded the still life, he's foregrounded the meat stall, and he's moved the landscape um, or the, the religious narrative to the, to the background of the painting. And I, I think that I was less attracted to the, even though it's a technically exquisite painting to look at, um, I think I was maybe less um, interested in this painting as, um, as a visual as I was the concept, this idea that there was this shift or this deliberate um, movement of bringing the still life to the forefront and in so not just thinking about it formally, thinking about the content of bringing, bringing labor to the forefront, bringing something to the front of the composition um, that wasn't at its polished version. Um, we're not looking at uh, pristine China and you know the final meal here. We're not looking at the, the Instagram foodie selfie of uh, a polished table. We're looking at um, the, the raw ingredients presented in a painterly way. Um, and that really kind of got me, got me moving towards the, uh, latter work of what you're seeing, um, at Broward currently. Um, so this was a, this was a painting that was introduced to me from a, a book called Looking at the Overlooked. Um, anyone that's interested in still life or landscape or the, kind of the, the blurry space between the two, I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, this happened about in, in, in the middle, maybe maybe 2021, kind of moving into the last year of making work for this show. So what we're looking at here is um, tabletop softy uh, after the meat stall. I feel like it's it was important for me to kind of include a direct reference to that particular painting. Um, there there are moments within this multi-panel piece that I am directly quoting uh, the history of that meat stall painting. Um, and and again, I just want to emphasize that this idea of the flipped still life, this idea of bringing bringing the still life objects to the forefront of the composition, pushing back the landscape and thinking about how, how that inverse relationship really kind of affects our reading of the painting. And, and I, you know, me as a maker, it was just exciting to uh, kind of think about that in, in paint of, of, okay, you know, I had been dealing with these landscapes for the past maybe 10 years where um, I had been trying to convince the viewer of maybe 20 yards, uh, maybe 50 yards of pictorial space, where here I'm really referencing collage and really referencing a thin layer of, of, of one paper, one image to the next. Um, and, and to me, that was kind of, I don't know, the next step in bringing, um, bringing the content to the surface of the painting um, and thinking about the surface in a, in a little different way than I had been in the past. I, th I think that before the work that I'm showing today, I had really considered um, still life objects as a way of uh, maybe uh, you know, being symbols or standing in for other kind of um, uh, ecology forward thoughts that I was having about a particular place and a, um, helping to identify a particular place. And, and in here, I really don't feel like I, I was doing that. I really wasn't looking for a symbolic relationship. I was, I was more interested in how can I, how can I bring these things right to the surface of the, of the painting and still get depth, but by 
um, I don't know, but 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 maybe you know two inches rather than rather than twenty yards. Um, at this time, I was also kind of thinking about the tabletop um, again, thinking about the meat stall and thinking about how in in, in that painting. The, the tabletop it plays such a big role in still life. It's where we prop things up. It's where we kind of isolate this world. And it's where we kind of present it as a view for other people uh, to, to knowingly look at, right? And I, I love that the, that, that the butcher stall, again, presents this kind of uh, raw view of what that might look like. Um, and so I was thinking of the tabletop both as a place of presentation, um, think of a dining table, and also a, a place of preparation. So maybe butcher block to diner table uh, or dining room table, thinking about the drafting table to the wall. Um, and, and, and the drafting table, of course, you know, again, kind of thinking about making the work in um, uh, as collage, referencing the table. Um, these paintings definitely make a conscious decision to directly reference collage um, in a way that, that I hadn't necessarily done in the past. And so um, when, when, when I Something that I meant to do when, when I was talking about this slide is kind of present it in a way that um, this was, you know, when, when, when I was looking at this, I was looking at these thin layers of paper kind of layered one on top of the other, just getting this little bit of pictorial depth. When I moved to this piece here, I'm looking for just a little bit more space. I started using physical objects again, so not necessarily um, just uh, collaging paper on paper, but also thinking about how I could get just a little bit more space from the objects I was looking at. And I included a video here right at the, the, the end of the presentation that I hope kind of um, presents that just little bit of depth that uh, may, maybe this triptych was looking at. So what we're looking at here is two pieces of glass and two images. And I'm using these rolled pieces of clay or rolled pieces of Play-Doh as um, spacers between the work. Um, so again, that gives me just that kind of one inch from, uh, from physical collage to maybe something that's a little bit more of a sculptural collage. Um, and, and, and again, thinking about this collapse space, thinking about um, the floral, floral arrangement as a, a microecology, I think that's something that the Dutch still life painters did. I think that was something that, you know, I had kind of been reading about before this work. Um, then the pandemic hits and you're, you're, you're raising kids, you and your wife have the same studio, uh, your kids are entering that studio. I think it was only natural that, um, you know, I have a seven-year-old son that uh, started becoming very interested in, in, in making, making art and making objects and making images. And, you know, I think that when you talk about like the very elementary, the first thing that, uh, that kids draw, um, Buzz Spector talks very eloquently about this. The first thing the kids draw is, is, is a smiley face, right? One circle, two dots, and, and this kind of happy face kind of thing. It's the first bit of representation that they have where they say, okay, this is, um, I just made something. Uh, Play-Doh does the same thing for kids. The Play-Doh snake in particular, or the coil, um, you know, before that, they're just kind of patting it together and making inanimate abstract objects. Um, as soon as they start to kind of roll it, they kind of start to see it as an object. They see it as an animal, as a snake. And I don't know, there's just something really innocent about that and something very primitive or very beginning about that that, that started to become a motif as I, as I worked through, um, through these compositions. That might've been a little bit of a digression, but uh, I, 
I, I hope that it it explains a little bit of how these um, rolled pieces of Play-Doh came into the paintings. Angel, there's your lovely uh, installation image. Thank you so much for doing that. And then maybe just to end with this uh, painting real quickly, uh, Ponytail Palm Anniversary, uh, excuse me, Pony Palm Anniversary. Um, this is a particular piece that I intend to be a durational piece. Um, it's the first time it's been shown is here at the Rosemary Duffy Larson Gallery. Um, I, my, my wife and I bought it for each other when our new daughter, our pandemic daughter turned one. Um, I intend to kind of keep painting versions of this uh, every year as we kind of uh, progress every year until the plant dies. And when the plant dies, I'm going to start getting scared. So uh, uh, hopefully there are many iterations of this to come. Uh, but when thinking about layers, when thinking about duration, when thinking about large ecologies and small ecologies, um, this painting really kind of sums that up for me. And uh, is something that I hope to return to um, uh, here in the next few years. Angel, that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions after uh, after Lee talks, but um, if you could force quit me out of this, that'd be great. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Jim. Okay, so I'm gonna stop your sharing. So I definitely want you guys to ask Jim questions, but I want to do it at the end. So if you, if things have been like coming into your mind at home, just type it into the chat so you don't forget. And after Lee speaks, we'll, we'll put it all together. But thank you so much for sharing the behind the scenes influences and process and concepts. Thank you so much. That was great. Okay, so um, Lee, Lee Merrill is next. So if you want to- That was to wonderful. That was wonderful, Jim, thank you. And Angel, thank you for inviting both of us to exhibit in the gallery. I also wish that I was able to be there um, and see the work in person, but it's nice to still be able to join everyone virtually. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So um, I make artwork about perception and place. And I work primarily with the medium of photography because as an artist, I find myself just endlessly fascinated with the medium. It is a tool that provides us evidence of existence. It plays this really critical role in documenting our personal and collective histories. But simultaneously, it's a system to mediate and construct reality. It is full of illusion. And in my own work, I'm really interested in calling attention to the complicated relationship that photography has to notions of uh, perception and truthfulness and reality. And I do so by also looking at the built environment. And I wanted to just share some images of previous works and exhibitions kind of in the background while I talk about some of the history and information that leads into the work that's in the exhibition at the gallery. So, you know, what, one of the things I'm really interested in with place is a kind of rich experience we have when we are either visiting a place or living in a place where we can see the kind of layering of history and time and all those sort of cultural and historical forces that shape the places in which we live. And that experience is also very much impacted by our own perceptions. So I think that the experience of place is this really kind of rich layered experience. And I want my photographs to kind of be able to echo that in some way. And so the way that I've done that is I create digital collages that themselves are a layering of a number of different photographs from a variety of different locations. And this method or this practice of creating digital collages, for me, it becomes this sort of metaphor for the way we construct the places that we live in. And so my process takes me to numerous cities and neighborhoods where I'm taking thousands and thousands of photographs of architectural structures and elements and landscaping, essentially creating a really large database of images to work from and work with. And um, essentially what happens is after I go out and make my source material back in the studio, working in Photoshop, I start with the blank canvas and bring in photographs and slowly start to blend them together. And the pieces sometimes will take months to make, sometimes a year, and not because they're so technically complicated, but because the practice for me, it's, it's important to kind of contemplate the piece and 
and allow it to evolve. And when I change one part of the, the canvas, it affects the rest of it. And so there's this kind of constant back and forth that occurs. And one of the things that, you know, starting to describe the practice, I think it uh, has a lot more similarities to a more generative art making practice or painting practice than a more sort of traditional photographic one. And each one of my photographs tends to have about five to 10 sort of base photographs to create the essential kind of composition. And then a ton of fragments of photographs and just an enormous amount of digital manipulation to make the photographs sort of come together seamlessly. And I'm essentially reassembling and recycling architectural elements from different times and locations together to create new and non-existent places. And one of the things, especially knowing that there's students here, one of the things that I think can be really helpful to start to understand sort of what's happening is to just kind of break down an image a little bit. So this particular photograph, hardware, all of the source photos come from a small town in Northern California. And when I go into a place, I'll make thousands and thousands of photos and then work with those. Some of my photographs will end up with hundreds of photographs to comprise the whole. Um, this particular image, these are four of the initial source photographs. The source that's on the upper left was an abandoned gas station. And I really liked the window and the drapes. And so I manipulated that to become the sort of bay window structure on the final photograph. And there's also manipulation of color and in addition to form. The source photo on the upper right, um, the, there's a building in the center that's gray and yellow. And I really like that color palette. So that became one of the driving forces for the sort of way I was working with color in the final image. And I also really liked the text that was on there. So the text hardware is really easy to identify in the center of the image and probably very hard to see, especially via Zoom, but the other, the paints, oils, glass, that text, I manipulated it to become sort of, uh, to look as if it's embossed into the glass of the, the bay window. Um, the source on the lower left is kind of easy to identify that that is part uh, of the structure that was created in the final photograph. There's also a stop sign that shows up. The palm tree is one of the many um, plants that I used to sort of adorn the building structure. And these are just four of the source photos that were utilized to help create this piece. But there's many other photographs that um, kind of help to make the piece sort of come to fruition. And when I think about sort of the influences and makes me interested in place and interested in how we construct place, I think it has a lot to do with having grown up in the Southwest. And I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the Southwest is no more sort of constructed or fabricated than other places, but its landscape reveals it real directly. When we see a perfectly manicured lawn up against a desert landscape, there's this real acute awareness that that's not a natural part of the environment, but something specifically placed there with specific desires, intentions, notions of beauty in mind. And I happen to have grown up in a neighborhood in Albuquerque called Cherry Hills, and cherry trees are not native to Albuquerque, and my neighborhood was not particularly hilly. Cherry Hills was a developer-driven neighborhood like many neighborhoods. And its name, I can only assume, was used to kind of create a new branding, desire for a particular place, a new history. And my parents were some of the first homeowners in that neighborhood. And so when my family, when we moved in, my parents recognized that the neighborhood was missing its signature tree. There's not a single cherry tree in Cherry Hills. And so in this gesture of um, you know, beauty and irony and humor, my parents planted several cherry trees in our small suburban lot. And essentially they reified the constructed history of my neighborhood, which I loved as a kid. And sort of looking back, I think that became the sort of, I don't know, metaphorical foundation of my interest in place. And I think it really fueled an interest in thinking about how place can hold within it both truth and fiction and very much is a collaboration and sometimes conflict between our personal as well as our collective ideals and desires and expectations. And so all the work that I've been making for about the last decade has been um, a series, you know, a series of digital clauses sort of looking at place and thinking about these ideas. And that's true of the work that's in the gallery at the college. And the works that are in the gallery, they all come from a series that I call latent architecture. And latent refers to something not yet developed, hidden or concealed. And it's a term connected to darkroom analog based photography. 
Um, sometimes you, there's this reference to the latent image, thinking about the fact that when a photographer would make um, an exposure on film, it would be essentially hidden until the film is developed and then it would be revealed. And so the title of the series is both a nod to kind of photo history or that analog photo practice, but it's also very much a way to sort of refer to how the architectural elements within my photographs are revealed, concealed, erased, redacted, sometimes to the point where they become quite abstracted. And um, in this particular photograph of blue wall, the majority of the frame is filled with a blue field, which is created from layering a number of different photographs together to create the sort of nuance and color and the texture. And without the pavement in the bottom or the empty air conditioner frame in the upper right, the image would just sort of float to abstraction. And I was really interested throughout this, this particular series of works to have a push-pull between these sort of more concrete elements and these abstracted ones. And this image would be a real sort of, um, kind of extreme example of that. And in this photograph, the awning that we see in here, it was taken out of its original environment and then placed into this digital gray void. Much the same way this particular photograph, this awning was also taken out of its original environment and then placed into a digital, digitally constructed one. One, however, made up of a number of different photographs of brick walls and pavement. And both of the images are dealing with an element sort of taken out of one context and recontextualized. This one, however, significantly more sort of realistic, but they're both working in the same way. And I'm really interested in when they're um, in the same exhibition space, even if they're not necessarily next to one another, they challenge each other in their formal sort of emotive and sort of intellectual frameworks. And when I exhibit this work, I'm really interested in how the pairings of photographs together can create a dialogue or a conversation. And so they're always um, exhibited in some sort of parody, know if I was gonna go to a breakfast one. larger groups. And um, every time that I do that, they are, I always try and switch up the groups. And here is a um, photograph from the installation. And also thank you, Angel, for forwarding those on to us today. And in addition to sort of thinking about how the individual photographs um, can speak to one another in a larger context, I'm really thinking about um, ideas of juxtaposition when I'm building the photographs. And so all the photographs are, well, most of the photographs are built so that there is this sort of seamlessness to them. So that on first glance, you might kind of accept them as a real place. And then slowly through observation, start to realize that something is askew. There's often perspectives that are um, kind of inaccurate or color palette that might not seem natural, um, different sort of clues that things might be a bit off. Um, but there's never the ability, once somebody might discover that the images perhaps are digitally fabricated or manipulated, there's never the ability to truly discern what part of the image might have been true, what part of the image is absolutely false, what might have actually coexisted next to one another. Um, there's this sort of inability to fully sort of discern what has happened in the photograph. And at that point, it stops being about maybe the illusion or the technical way in which it was pieced together, but just about the place at which we're looking. And for me, I think it's really important that in this work, when you cannot truly discern between truth and fiction, it for me, it becomes a way of thinking about the fact that both of those things are very much a part of our experience of reality. And uh, almost all of my photographs are um, it's really kind of candy color, gym-like spaces that just kind of based on color palette kind of exude a certain joyfulness, but they're also very um, kind of almost uncomfortably vacant. And I'm really interested in how opposing elements can sort of come together, uh, whether they be sort of formal or emotive. And I think that interest is very much a part of what draws me to photography and the fact that in a single frame, a photograph can exhibit both truth and fiction. And my work very much hinges on the veracity or the truthfulness that we associate with photographs. And even though we know photographs are very easy to manipulate and have been since its inception, um, we still have this desire or willingness to believe in them. And whenever I share my work with someone who is unfamiliar with what I do and they're not aware that these are digital composites, inevitably one of the first questions I'll get is, where is this place? Which is a question I absolutely love because it's like the work is sort of a litmus test for our belief in the medium. And my photographs are obviously 
not at all documents of reality. They are absolutely fictions. But I think of them like conceptual documents to our relationship to place and the blurring of truth and fiction that often happens in our reality. And that's a little bit about the work in the, in the show. And that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, does anyone have any questions for either Jim or Lee? You can either uh, yes. unmute, yes. ask, or put it in the chat. Yes, I have a question. Wouldn't you consider, instead of photography, don't you consider this digital art? I mean, she's taking, um, it's not really a, is she's really made, is she really doing digital art with pieces like a collage of different photographs? That's my question. Is it really photography or is it digital? It's an artist who's making a one of a kind, you know, one of a kind new painting from photographs. <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And my practice is one that's, you know, I'm collaging the images and it's not as connected to what we might think of a more kind of traditional photographic practice, but it is actually in line with a lot of contemporary photography and that sort of manipulation distortion of the image. Um, and for me, it's actually, I, um, I definitely think it is photography because without that, um, there is a sense of um, seamlessness and connection to reality that is necessary, I think, for the concepts to come through in the work. And so if when we look at photographs, we often do think of them as, um, even though we know they can be distorted, we often have that sense of kind of um, connection to the real with them. And without that, I think that the sense of these as possible places or potential realities um, dissipates. And so they really are, um, sort of on a conceptual level, really fundamentally connected to photography, but I think on a sort of methodology or practice, they are connected to a lot of other methods of making. Thank you. Thank you for answering. <laughs> In the chat, Lewis had a question about oh. if, uh, if Lee, if you would consider uh, using paint or other or other materials. I, and I, I don't, I, I wonder if it's because um, I know that some people in the gallery when they saw your work at first, thought they were paintings, actually. <laughs> yeah, I wondered, could you try using like oil tempura for, a, for a ink or other material mediums to make new artwork? Um, well, I, uh... I, I think I mean <laughs> you know because I, I haven't I, I don't I don't I, I don't paint um, I think that the the sort of learning curve of being able to do like what Jim does like I, I think that would um, it would be such a different translation for me in just terms of how how I make work um, and so I you know I have there I do have a history of physically building things specifically to be photographed so this idea of kind of physically working with my hands um, uh, is something I really enjoy and and actually. Uh, at the beginning of my practice, you know, some like 20 years ago, I, I wanted to construct spaces and I didn't really have any other way to do that besides physically making them. And then when um, digital te technology got um, good enough, I felt like I was able to then um, translate that practice into a, a sort of a digital form where instead of physically making things, I could just go and collect source material. Um, but, you know, um, I think that you know, there's always, who knows what the future holds. Um, and I think it's important to kind of be open, uh, but for now, I I probably won't start painting these. And, you know, when we um, brought these two artists together, you know, they are so different in some ways, but I think hopefully through uh, their short lectures, you got maybe a sense of, even though it's completely different medium um, and, you know, one is more, a little more, natural, a little more man-made. You could see there are like some conceptual links. So really, you know, we all have different media that we that we choose, but there's so much that we can say uh, with that media. So thank you, Lee. Um, there was a question for, for Jim about how long did it take to make your large um, triptych piece? So the triptych took about um, took about three months to make. I'd say about a month per panel. Um, but I, I really prefer to work on paintings um, 
several at a time. So the idea of being able to hop from maybe those small panels that um, it, the smaller modular work towards uh, and, and, and have the, the triptych on one wall, the modular piece on another, and then um, a piece like the uh, Pony Palm Anniversary as something that kind of continuously gets uh, brought from the, the back of the studio to the front and worked on a little bit and then, and then brought back to, to, to the back of the studio is it, really important to me to be able to um, uh, not necessarily see one project completely through before starting the next. Um, I think that that's a trick of working modularly for me as well. Um, it's really important to me that the triptych isn't just a large painting cut into three pieces, right? Like I think that if you go and look at it in the gallery, you'll see that there's, um, yes, there's similarities. Yes, they were made to go together, um, but they don't necessarily line up right at the edge. It's, it's more of an idea of how can I get this subject to continue to this next frame and then continue to this next frame in a way that relates to each other. Um, again, w w without getting like too headsy about it, like I, I just feel like that really goes into this discussion of ecology and the idea of how things are, are influencing each other either very purposefully or just by uh, um, the physical nature of them being close to each, each other. Um, so so I, I try to have several works kind of going at the same time in the studio. Um, it, it, if, I, if I can kind of jump in and hop on someone else's question for Lee, um, I was so happy or so interested that she brought up this idea of the believability of photography from the get-go, right? That it's kind of a medium that we believe in or that doesn't have to necessarily prove its belie believability from the beginning uh, versus painting that, that has that opposite struggle of uh, no matter how realistic or how the trompe l'oeil is done, it's always kind of considered unreal until, until somehow it comes off of that 2D surface. Um, and, and that's just a really enjoyable conversation for me when I when I think about um, Lee's work. Um, I, I mean, I, I before I knew that they were digital constructions, I, I had this thought of it being somehow um, uh, physically constructed, and, and I, I don't think I don't think there's much difference there. I think that the way that you're collaging feels. Um, feels seamless in a way that I probably can't achieve in paint, um, but uh, conceptually is, is very similar. Yeah, thank you. And, and if you guys have questions or comments about each other, absolutely. <laughs> There's another um, question in the chat, which you did answer, Jim. The last, the last question that she had was, uh, what kind of paint do you use? These are oil on canvas. Um, I feel like oil, lends itself to a malleability that um, uh, that allows you to kind of transition from one kind of observation to another pretty seamlessly when you want them to. Um, I was never able to achieve that in acrylic and I, I just really kind of uh, in, in enjoy that history of oil on canvas. So that's, that's something that I intend to uh, continue with and uh, yeah, oil, oil on canvas. There's another question in the chat for Lee, um, and Aubrey wants to know, oops, it's kind of moved here. Uh, where do you get your inspiration to make each digital art piece? Do you usually have the inspiration or ideas already in mind, or do you have a process of figuring out what you want in certain areas of your work? Yeah, so I, um, I just have sort of, there's always sort of this ongoing kind of general interest in place um, and how we construct place that kind of fuels the pieces, um, but typically where I start is when I go out shooting, um, there sometimes will be a, a building or an architectural element that will really kind of stick with me. And then when I start to build the piece, um, I'll start with some of those initial photographs that were really um, exciting to me. And sometimes those become a part of the fi finished piece. Sometimes they get sort of buried underneath the layers, um, but that typically is where it starts. And I don't um, ever really have, um, 
With rare exception, I don't know where the photograph is going to take me. Um, I'll start with sources and then allow the photograph to kind of um, figure out where it needs to go. And sometimes, you know, I can, it, it sort of reveals itself really quickly and the pieces come together fast and sometimes they really take a long time. Um, and so I don't know if that <laughs> helps to answer the question, um, but that, that's sort of the process. Thank you. Uh, hold on, there's another question that just popped up. Uh, for, for Lee, you mentioned that a big part of your process involves making the image seamless to the point where the viewer mistake it, mistakes it for reality, but there's also some times where the effect is uncanny. Do you intentionally turn your photos into liminal spaces between destinations, or is it more of a byproduct? You know, it, from image to image, it really varies um, how sort of connected to reality, how kind of uncanny they are. And I am often trying to, when I'm making my photographs and I think about them, you know, they need to be successful as individual pieces. But I'm also, um, similar to how Jim was talking about, there's always multiple pieces going on at the same time. Like I'm often working on a lot of different photographs and at some point I'm working on all of them for an exhibition. And there becomes this point where they, there's um, some of the decision in terms of how, how they're going to feel or how realistic they are um, is in part sort of thinking about the conversation they're going to have. And so some of the images I know that I don't want them to be too realistic or some of them, you know, and so there's, um, there's this balancing act, not only within an individual photograph, but sort of all the images together as a group. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, Rod, who is, is that question for Lee? Rod asks in the chat, who are some of your influences? Yeah, was, oh, uh, I see. Um, yeah, I think, let me see. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, the photography, I, yeah, I wondered who that, who the interests, who are influ influenced her the most. Or if um, she had certain influences that took her in this direction. So there's actually another question in the chat that was just directly to me, which actually <laughs> um, connects to this. Um, so in terms of photo history, the new topographics photographers um, were very influential, influential in terms of thinking about this idea of observing the landscape. And the thing that to me I really um, loved about their work is uh, it's a series of ph photographers, um, mainly from, from the 70s and 80s, whose work is still um, kind of influential today. But they were looking at the sort of shifting, shifting topography of the landscape, um, sort of, of the American West, and not necessarily just there, but, um, and thinking about um, the sort of change and sort of the growth into the rural areas. And a lot of those photographs, they are thought of as being these really sort of objective images. But one of the things I find really interesting is it feels like this sort of exaggerated way of documenting sort of a notion of truth that those photographs are just as subjective as a photograph with a more maybe dramatic angle of view. And we just psychologically read them as being more truthful. So I'm interested in, in them in terms of the way that they looked at the landscape, but also this idea of how truth can be conveyed in a photograph. And then I'm equally as interested in mannerist painting and the kind of acidic color palettes that they use and how they kind of exaggerate reality in a very different way. And so I kind of think of um, those are two uh, kind of big influences on my practice. It's so interesting that you mentioned the the mannerist. It's not the first thing that I would have thought of, but once you say <laughs> that, I'm like, it makes sense. I see that. <laughs> um, there's another question for Lee. Um, in something like your blue wall piece, will you edit the photographs to match the colors or do you look through your collection and find the ones that match the best? Um, so I, uh, I can manipulate the color quite a bit in Photoshop. So if I have, if I have an, an architectural element or a texture that I really like, but it's not the color I want, I, I can start to manipulate that. Um, so, but, but for the blue wall piece, I did actually go sort of seeking out and looking for a variety of different blue walls. Um, and it's comprised of a number of different surfaces, but many of them in fact are um, actually blue walls, um, which isn't always the case. <laughs> if there are any other questions, speak up or put it in the chat. 
Well, I want to thank you both so much for uh, sharing with us tonight. Uh, oh, there's something else in the chat. Uh, to, to James, your work is impressive. And I felt the reading Albert Camus and his idea of our everydayness absurdity and how we can bring beauty from each situation in life, even if we are among the artificial and the nature. Thank you so much. So yeah, if you guys have comments too, you can absolutely share them as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. But um, unless there's anything else, I want to thank you guys so much for speaking with us tonight and sharing with us. Uh, the show just opened today, so I know some of you may not have gotten the chance to see it in person yet. Um, we'll be open through Saturday, then we're closed next week, but then we're open through April 6th. So uh, come check us out on Central Campus of Broward College. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming out tonight and participating. Um, and I hope you all have a great evening and come check out the show. Thank you so much, Thank you Angela. So much. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>